Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah McLean, and it is March 19th, 2020. And we are calling this series now the Corona Challenge. We're challenging ourselves to reframe what some people are calling a crisis or a pandemic. And we are aiming to address the panic and the stressors and the amygdala hijack that can occur when you start to think about your mortality or think about the ways in which your life could possibly change with the current uh, activity of this virus. So my name is Sarah McLean. I've been teaching meditation since 1993. Uh, it's my favorite thing to do, or one of them, besides walking on the beach, being with my dogs and hanging out and laughing. Um, but I'm really thrilled to be of service during this because I know a lot of people are concerned about what's going to happen next and that uncertainty and the way the mind wanders into sometimes worst case scenarios can start to create what's called the amygdala hijack. And for those of you who don't know what that is, there's a part of your brain that gets activated. It's really designed to save your life, but it gets activated at the thought of, of um, something dangerous. It could even get activated when you're watching horror movies or recalling something horrible that happened to you or hearing about something that happened to somebody else or projecting into the future some imagined scene. So the amygdala is so powerful and so unreasonable. So it's powerful because it can save your life by kind of monitoring your thoughts and your environment and instantaneously shooting out an ocean, an ocean of hormones like cortisol, your stress indicator, uh, adrenaline, which sharpens your sights and your senses. It can also change the way your body kind of operates, shunting all the blood that's in your sex organs, organs and your belly into your heart and lungs. It also starts to raise your blood pressure. So all that blood moves into your arms and legs so you can run or flee if you need to. And then your platelets get really sticky. So if you do get into some trouble, you don't bleed to death. You might start to sweat, your breath starts to change, and all of this happens even without you knowing it. And you all know what it's like if you're driving along and somebody pulls out in front of you, you think you're about to get hit, but you don't. There's an instantaneous change in the body and in the mind, which starts to program you to look for what other crazy drivers out there is gonna do that to you. So this amygdala hijack is something that happens when we don't exercise the, that cortex, the neocortex, neo meaning new, the new part of the brain. The amygdala is part of the older part of the brain. And the new part of the brain is designed to create rational thought. It's designed to help you be compassionate and inclusive with other people. It's a little less self-centered and a little more other-centered. So the amygdala hijack is when, when you hear the news on a 24-7 news cycle and you start to scare yourself, the amygdala doesn't know any better and it's preparing you to fight or flee. One other thing that happens is it starts to activate your immune system. And it's not a, uh, an immune system activation that's gonna protect you from the virus. It's an immune system activation that's just really designed to take care of any, um, anything that's a threat locally, like pollen and maybe um, other local uh, challenges. So if your fight or flight response is constantly activated, this can confuse your immune system and often can lead to autoimmune disorders and overactivated immune system. Now, I'm not a doctor, I don't play one on TV, but I do know that when we have chronic stressors, whether it's from childhood stress, from a workplace stress, from a difficult relationship, that your body doesn't lie. It is constantly monitoring what's going on and kind of reacting to it in some way, trying to save your life. So earlier on the call today, we were talking about stressors and how they accumulate and sometimes they accumulate unnoticed. And then suddenly you wake up one morning and you can't really digest your food or you're allergic to everything or you've got chronic pain that 
that Advil just won't help. Or you notice you're cranky or depressed or angry or anxious. And this can be uh, due to an accumulation of stress in your nervous system that previously was not even uh, indicated or you didn't even notice. And it's like it shows up to be paid attention to. Luckily with meditation, we have a couple of things going for us. Number one, it helps us to become much more self-aware. So when the body starts showing signs of activation of the uh, fight or flight response, we can meet it with rationalization. We can meet it with another practice such as being mindful or such as being relaxed or activating the rest and digest response, the parasympathetic response. Sympathetic, S for stress, P, parasympathetic, P for peace. And as we become a little more aware of our operating system, of our physiology, which is always telling the truth, then we can start to meet that with our neocortex, our, the smart part of our brain. I call it the executive, the CEO, and say, you know what? I'm tired of walking around with these knots in my stomach I'm, and I'm going to do something about it. Or I'm tired of constantly being future focused and scaring the daylights out of myself. I'm going to bring myself right back here into a mindful awareness. So today I thought we could um, just check in and see who is here for the first time. Um, I know many of you are muted and if there's anyone here for the first time, would you either raise your hand or... Um, put it in the chat box. Okay, great. So a couple of you are here for the first time. I, and I know some of you don't have a meditation practice. So for those of you who are new to meditation, I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, I've never met anyone that can't do it. Okay, so you have everything it takes to meditate. Now you might be new at it and you might want all kinds of uh, bells and whistles. And I can tell you that meditation works on the subtler levels. The subtler levels, like the nervous system, as it kind of changes your operating system from the fight or flight response to the rest and digest response, even if you don't think it's working. So I thought what we could do is spend a little, a moment asking ourselves the question, you know, what scares me? What's kind of bothering me over the last, you know, over the last couple of weeks as we've been living with, um, this virus, the threat of this virus, the more um, uh, the more restrictions on our lifestyle. Maybe you're having some challenges with your workplace or your family being at home with you or your kids that you have to take care of or you don't have any more toilet paper left or whatever the case, or you don't like to cook and you can't go to restaurants. What is it that is scaring you? And, and you know, think about it. Um, maybe it's a thought you have. Like, it'll never be the same or we'll never be peaceful or maybe I'm not healthy enough to withstand this challenge. I'd invite you right now to identify one thought, one thought that is persistent, that you can't pretend away, that you can't ignore, that um, is your constant companion and probably activates some sort of emotion that causes you suffering. So think of one thought. I know you probably, some of us have many, many, many thoughts, but just think of one and make it as petty as you want. You know, maybe it's, um, I'll never get my job back or I'll never be able to pay my rent or um, I don't have enough dog food. It could be petty, it could be deep, it could be existential, like I'm not gonna live through this. So come up with one, just one. And I'm going to invite us to meet this amygdala activating thought with some rationality, with some inquiry. Now, for those of you new to meditation, this is a form of meditation. Some people would say there are two paths to enlightenment. One is surrender and one is inquiry. So what I'll do is ask you to come up with that one thought. You might even write it down in front of you just because the mind likes to travel into all kinds of scenarios. And we're going to first do a little bit of uh, breath awareness and softening the body. And then we'll move into an inquiry, uh, really looking into this thought and what it, its ripple effect is. And maybe meeting it with some, the CEO of the brain, the neocortex. 
So for those of you who are relatively new to meditation, I just want to share a few little items here. Get comfortable. Comfort is key. Uh, you don't have to be perfectly still, nor do you have to stop thinking. If you notice that your mind is really active and moving into other time zones, even though your body's here, your breath is here, your life is here, see if you can bring it back again and again. And meditation's a practice. It's a training for coming back here. Number two, be nice to yourself in there. Do not spend any time here beating yourself up. It is not helpful. Uh, you might as well treat yourself like a good friend. You might as well start treating yourself well in meditation because how you treat yourself in meditation is a practice for how you treat yourself with your eyes open. So let's be kind to ourselves. Number three, don't try to have a certain experience other than the one you're having. We're not trying to be spiritual here. We're not trying to be enlightened here, although it'd be nice, but we don't want to try. It's going to be spontaneous. Peace is spontaneous. Um, aha moments are spontaneous. So we're just going to welcome what already is here and not try to make something happen. Number four, let go of any expectation you might have. You might, this might be your 200th meditation or it might be your first. Whatever it may be, treat it as if it's the first time you've done it and be curious be open, be relaxed. And the last is let's stick with the practice. If you can, even though the mind might wander into difficult territories, just come on back here to where everything's okay. Your body's here, your breath is here, your life is here. And when you bring your attention right back into this moment, it's a little less scary. It's the uncertainty that frightens most of us. So come here and look around your space where you are right now. Find a few things you're grateful for, whether it's some flowers or your lamp or your computer or your mug or a pen. Just find something. Maybe you have a pretty view out your window or your dog sitting nearby like mine. Find something you're grateful for or a few of them. Find solace in this moment. So I'll invite you to close your eyes, but if you do need to open them at any time, you can certainly do that. I'm not going to be watching you. Some of you are even on the phone. I have no idea what you're doing. And um, you can keep your eyes closed or capped, which means gazing toward the floor. Hands can be comfortable in your lap, face up or face down, whatever's comfortable. Even hold them together, hold your own hand, and just find a comfortable spot wherever you are right now and settle into it. You might even deepen your breath just a little bit. This sends a signal to your body that it's okay to relax. Everything is fine in this moment. The future is made up of present moments. And though we all have hopes and dreams of a beautiful and bright future. It all occurs right now. As I'm deepening my breath, my dog just took a nice deep breath because it's time for her to relax. So be like a dog or a cat and take that deep breath, signaling to the body it's okay, it's safe. Sometimes mind follows body, sometimes body follows mind. And then let your breath return to its natural rhythm and depth. The mind is right here with the body and the breath, but it can drift away. And when it does, bring it back. And we're going to bring it back by paying attention to one of two things. Either body sensations or the sensation of breathing. So right now, let's scan the body and notice the sensations that are here. Maybe you feel some warmth or some coolness. Maybe you feel some softening in your face or your belly. Maybe you feel some movement, subtle movements, like the movement of your breath or your heartbeat. And perhaps you feel some stillness. 
So tune into stillness. Maybe you can feel some lightness. And maybe you feel some density, some heaviness, maybe where you're sitting or where your feet are meeting the floor. Scanning the body for sensation without any stories without preference, but with curiosity and a beginner's mind. Perhaps you notice the clothing on your skin or the way your eyelids close and meet or your lips close and meet. Perhaps you notice the weight of your hands on your lap or the support behind your back. And bringing your attention to the breath. Noticing the sensations of inhaling and exhaling. Noticing the movement and the stillness, the pauses between each breath. The active inhale and the active exhale. Becoming aware of each breath, you might even silently say to yourself, in on the inhale and out as you exhale. Keeping the mind right here where your life is. And now we're going to bring our attention to that one phrase or that one thought that can scare us a little bit or cause some suffering. So we're only going to work with one thought, not all of them at once. So bring that thought to mind. Could be about yourself or the world, about your health or your family your future. And with that one thought, ask yourself the question, is it true? Is it true? We know you believe it, but is it true? And can you absolutely know it is true? And now ask yourself the question, how do I react when I think this thought? How do I react when I think this thought? You can even imagine yourself walking into a room and having that thought. And how does it affect you? How do you behave? Towards yourself. How do you behave towards others? How do you physically feel when you think this thought? What choices do you make?
And then how do you live with this thought? And here's a bonus question. What are the payoffs for continuing to think this thought? It might be something like you get to be separate or right or less than or better than. You get to be small or live some way that's very familiar. What are the payoffs for having this thought? And here's another question for you. Who would I be if I couldn't think this thought? Who would I, who would I be without this thought? How would you live if you were unable to think this thought? Feel what that feels like in your body. See yourself in your mind's eye. And imagine life for a moment without this thought. And now we're going to direct the attention once again to the body. Noticing how the body's feeling right now. Noticing the support around you. Bringing your attention right here. Maybe tapping into the sensation of breathing. And we'll do a breath awareness practice for another few minutes. I'll keep track of the time. Just be here now. There's nothing else to do. Simply let that breath bring you home to this moment. Let your body bring you home to this moment. If you notice yourself telling yourself a story, come back to what's really happening right here. Breathing and sitting. When the mind wanders off, come on back. Doesn't matter how many times you have to come back. And in this stillness, we're going to imagine that we're, we've created a still pond. We're going to throw some pebbles into it that create ripple effects. The first pebble will be the pebble of peace. Silently saying the word peace a few times. Maybe once every few seconds, peace. 
peace. We'll throw another now. Harmony. Repeating that to yourself. Another one. Joy. And one more, love. and add whatever ingredient you'd like to add that you'd like to feel the ripple effects of. And letting that pond return to the stillness. Notice how you're feeling. With your eyes closed, you can begin to deepen your breath if you like. Sensing the space around you without opening your eyes. Maybe listening for the sounds around you, welcoming everything. And when you feel like you'd like to, you can slowly open your eyes, but take your time. Don't rush. Find out what your speed is. You can open your eyes first with a downward gaze if you like, and open them all the way. Maintaining kind of that inner awareness and even appreciating yourself for taking that time, this time, to be present with yourself, to take care of your nervous system, to create that ripple of peace that we desperately need and can uh, ripple out into the world. So that practice, that inquiry, so is it true can you absolutely know it's true? How do I live with that thought? This is all from the work of Byron Katie, a woman I used to work for, and a brilliant teacher, B-Y-R-O-N-K-A-T-I-E. And it's really revealing to watch what happens when you think a thought and how it affects everything, every way you live whether the thoughts are simple as, I don't have what it takes, or I'll never find love, or there'll never be peace, or I'm afraid I'll lose my job. What happens and how it, it ripples out, it can really affect you. 
So you don't want to let your thoughts hijack you, especially if they're miserable and you don't want them to scare you. So you meet them simply by asking, is it true? Obviously I believe it, but is it actually true? Can I absolutely know it's true? Who would I be without this thought? How would I live? I don't know what it felt like for you, but um, most people feel a sense of lightness of being. When they say, gosh, I don't need to walk around with that thought. Just even for an instant, there's a, a dismantling, a, an uncoupling of those neuronal pathways, those well-worn highways in your brain where you think one thing, you behave a certain way, and you think that same thing again, you behave a certain way, and you, you don't change anything, and here it comes, the life that you have and the fear that you might have or the anxiety or the separateness, whatever it may be. And to be able to just go, wait just a second, who would I be without this thought? So it works sometimes. It doesn't mean you're never going to have that thought again, but it's a beautiful way to at least have a momentary respite from the suffering that that thought creates. Of course, we did the sutra practice at the end. A, a sutra practice is like creating a, a stitch, an intention that you really, you plant it in that stillness that you created through the mindfulness. So we used peace, harmony, joy, love, and one of yours, whatever you chose. Could have been enlightenment, could have been just about anything, delight, creativity. So I would love to hear how that went for you. I'm uh, seeing a lot of, for those of you on the phone, we have a lot of people in the chat box, people from Venice Beach and Gilbert, Arizona, San Francisco, uh, Sarah's favorite cousin, Barry from Boston, Sherry from Charlottesville, Virginia, and uh, your daughter's first time, Julie. Hi, I don't know if you're still with us, but good for you. And um, yeah, we may have mistreated our planets. How as a collective can we change this energy? I think that's what we're doing in the chat box. You know, how can we change the energy? Well, I think it's individual. I wish that there was a big blanket that we could throw over everybody and change the whole vibe. And that's why I teach meditation, but I realize it, it's a requirement for each one of us to take personal responsibility for the actions we take and the choices we make and the way we spend our money and the way we interact with this world of resources that is here for us in abundance. I was interviewing a woman, you might've heard of her. Um, she is the woman that, oh gosh, I have to think of her name right now, but you'll remember. She used to sit up in those uh, giant sequoia trees before because there was a big company that liked to cut them all down, Julia Butterfly Hill. And she lived in a tree for over a year, maybe about 10 stories up. And um, Lumber Liquidators, it's a big lumber company, they wanted to cut down all these old growth forests. And she lived in the tree and they couldn't cut it down. And she spent a lot of time up there and they tried to knock her off. They buzzed her with helicopters. They, they harassed her from the air and the ground. And I uh, interviewed her because I, I'm an environmental activist, but I would not go sit in a tree for a year, although I might do other things somewhat similar. Um, and I said, well, you know, what do we do? Because so many of us are frustrated by the, you know, the way the planet is being mistreated. This planet loves you so much. And she says, you know, it's every moment. It's every moment. We have to be aware of our actions in every moment. And that's where meditation comes in. Because, you know, we get into these road activities, the default neural network that kicks in, and we don't even know what we're doing. We don't even remember driving home. It's not that we were drunk. It's just that we were doing these activities that the, the brain goes offline. And it happens a lot, whether it's we buy the same things or we take the same takeouts or we make the same food or we dispose of our trash the same way. So bringing mindfulness into everything and starting to recognize the interconnectedness between you and everything else and starting to really honor the environment. And I, I know I've said this poem before, I'm gonna share it again because it really gave me some hope. It's by Lao Tzu, the, the Chinese um, philosopher, and he wrote the Tao Te Ching. And he said, in order to have peace in this planet, there must be peace between nations. In order to have peace between nations, 
there must be peace in the cities. In order to have peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. In order to have peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. In order to have peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. So getting back to our practice, your peace is your responsibility. Your meeting your own mind and questioning these beliefs that scare the daylights out of you, that's your responsibility. What you pay attention to and how you pay attention. You're the only one that can control that, although many people want to control that. How you choose to spend your day or respond to stress or meet other people and um, people that might be in need or activating compassion, that's all you. You're the only one. You're it. So that was very helpful for me to read that poem one day because I, lo I sometimes lose faith in it all. And um, I just come back to, wait a minute, I got to take care of me. And anyone who wants to join me on this journey. And that's why we're here because I know a lot of us are socially distant, but we can be socially together on these platforms, which I'm so grateful for. And um, even though it's a different crowd every day, I feel like we're all big one practice community. And even though you've got friends and family and relationships, they're not always going to be on this call, although I love it when they are. They're not always going to be your community of practice. So, you know, some of us need to have that. And so I'm really happy that we have that. It, for me, it became so evident that no matter where I am, I have this practice community. I have friends, I have family, I have people around me I love, and they're not the same people necessarily as this. So I love that you've chosen to come here and, you know, maybe after the social distancing is uh, complete, you will continue to find ways to support yourself. So uh, does anyone have anything they'd like to share before we stop our recording? How our brain and body are, are behaving when we're stressed. Yeah, it's really interesting to take a look at your hardware. This is your hardware. And the software is what's going on in your mind. But the hardware is your body, the hormones, the energy, you know, the, the skeletal systems, the food layer, you know, the energy systems. That's all the hardware. The software is what you're feeding into your mind, into your brain. The mind is your software. And it goes into your brain and activates all kinds of responses. And, you know, you're the only one that can control that. You get to decide what you want to pay attention to. You get to turn the TV off. You get to decide, you know, I'm not going to listen to this. I'm going to listen to something that lights me up, makes my brain, you know, excrete those yummy feel-good hormones. You know, you get to decide that. No one is imposing their will on what you're paying attention to. And even someone, uh, there was this book, and some of you have read it. Um, it's called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And he was a Holocaust uh, he lived in the Holocaust and was, a, I think he was a professor or a psychologist, and he started to watch behavior. And he knew that even if someone takes away everything and you're still alive, the only thing you have is your freedom of thought, your freedom of imagination. And yes, it can be hijacked by how you're physically feeling and we get that pain is pain. But he knew that if he could pay attention on purpose, he could survive it. Now, here's the where mindfulness is uh, not necessarily at, in a good idea, to be mindful of the suffering around you, to be mindful of the stress and the horror. He instead projected his mind into the future, projected it into his survival, and imagined himself in these classrooms teaching his students, and he survived it. And so making life meaningful for you being mindful, making life meaningful, being in charge of your attention because you're the only one. You're the only one that can control your attention. Even if you have a lot of drama in your household or a lot of drama in your body or a lot of drama in the, in the government or in the workplace, you get to decide. And you know, the more you meditate and the more you do mindfulness practices, the more you'll have control over how and what you pay attention to. So, okay, I'm going to stop our recording now.